Okay, this is the third lecture for chapter three. And we're gonna start off looking at that 10% rule, which again, we're looking at energy here. And what it points out is that the amount of energy diminishes every level of the food chain we go up. So the closer you eat to the bottom of the food chain, the more conserving you're doing as far as energy goes. Uh, so think about how you like to eat individually. But if you look at the original amount of material available, if we call it 10,000, it just doesn't matter. Uh, 10,000 is a number. And these initial producers are consumed and primary consumers. And then they, of course, are taken in by secondary consumers. Let's call them fish. And then, of course, we end up taking in the end result. And what out of the available 10,000 energy units that were originally there, there's only 10. So very, very little amount of the energy that started is actually taken at the end. So if we like fish, we're gonna have to produce lots and lots of fish that have that same energy resource. Now, looking at these little grimy little organisms there, uh, this probably isn't the best example. If you think of like grains and such, they are on the producer list and they're probably more in line with an energy savings than eating uh, zooplankton. Okay. So productivity. Uh, if you look around the United States, various places have more ability to grow food than others. Uh, making the comparison to where we live, some, somewhere in the yellow region, and you can see, all right, well, 12, 12.6, something like that. And then you look where a lot of our food comes from, and that tends to come somewhere out in this area in the, the prairies or the Great Plains and someone kind of out in this little area. But even more so, you get some places down in the south, uh, very productive locations down there. And of course, further out west, uh, actually about half the country, this huge, huge section over here in the western half of the country, not much uh, growing out there. And if you ever look at, uh, you know, if you've ever flown out that way, you'll see it yourself. So this is another way, let's see if I can get rid of some of this stuff here. Erase. There we go. Good enough. Um, looking at this for more uh, productivity in different locations, you can see that something we probably knew ahead of time is that tropical rainforests are very, very productive. But also right along with them are things like swamps, uh, just usually they're found in a fairly warm locations, but they're also very productive. Not a place, either one, you probably want to spend a lot of time. We happen to live in a very productive location, temperate rainforest, or excuse me, temperate forest. Um, I take that back, we don't live in a temperate forest. Uh, we live in a deciduous, if I can find it on here. Maybe they're just calling that temperate. I think temperate just being deciduous, so okay. That's us, we live in the temperate, temperate forest. And then you have the coniferous, if you go a little further north, uh, you, you're going to have more of a coniferous, the taiga. And then as far as aquatic system, estuaries, which is usually a mixing of freshwater and saltwater, is also a very, very productive location. Um, we look at lakes and streams, not even close in comparison to what's in the estuaries. So you think about things like crabs or shrimp or lobster, you're going to find those more like in an estuary-ish type of location. Crawfish. Um, NPP, the net primary productivity, that is the difference in energy. So that's a little definition. It is uh, the difference between the amount of energy that a particular organism takes in as far as a primary producer and the amount of energy it has to use for respiration. So it doesn't keep that respiration energy. So the NPP is the energy that it actually gets to store and become plant or fruit, whatever we want to look at. So the NPP is what it actually keeps, stores. Cultural services, that's a good one. Uh, we don't typically think about these as far as what nature can provide for us. We usually it's monetary or materialistic, uh, but nature does a lot more than that. It has these what's called cultural services. So it's things that we like, but you can't really put a price tag on directly. Uh, so, for example, you look at just your landscape. Uh, we like having a lot of trees out there and things that are attractive to us. 
Uh, they may have inspiration for us for whatever arts we like. Um, our religious backgrounds may have some basis or some influence uh, based on things we have around us, or at least it has historically. Uh, we like to spend time out there for one reason or another, uh, either just for trails or for tourism or sporting events. And the last one, which is probably maybe the closest to monetary, is there's a lot of things we use in nature that have been used for years and years, thousands of years, as medicine, and we use these things to influence us for producing new medicines and technology. So having a biodiverse world uh, is very, very beneficial to discover other products that we can actually make. Ultimately, you know, there's some profit in there, but there are things that we can use. So they provide a cultural service. Okay, different uh, little topic here, and this goes into a huge, huge topic, uh, soil. Uh, soil, we say, is slowly renewable, so there's a lot of locations in the country that we're overusing the soil. Um, we have to allow it to cycle and put nutrients back in there naturally. We don't always do this. Um, okay, uh, just looking at this last one here about horizons, we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in class lecture as well. You have these different layers, the first one being an O horizon, which is just the organic layers, the leaf litter, stuff sitting up on top. And then you have a, an A horizon, which is kind of just like your dirt layer, which you're probably most familiar with, your topsoil. And below that, I believe we're going to call that one, it's not listed here, your E layer, your zone of eluviation, where you have uh, materials or minerals being drained out. And I believe they will fall into the B layer, which is the subsoil below. And I think we have a slide here that kind of shows some of these different horizons. And then you have the C layer, which is pretty much your bedrock down below. So we'll get into more of this in class. It's just a little cutout here, just kind of showing. And this is very, very, very typical of having these different layers of soil. So it's not just dirt straight on down you typically are going to have what are called these lenses or horizons in the soil. And depending upon what part of the country you live in, you're going to have different soil types. So we kind of see a little bit of a difference here as far as you know the type of root systems that are necessary to obtain nutrients in a particular location based on uh, rain. So here's us in a deciduous location. So this is probably the most familiar to us. Uh, soil types in general. Uh, you can take a look here and see that uh, which one can hold more material. Um, actually, it would be this one over on the right-hand side. We can probably get, this isn't the best picture here, but clay soils will actually hold more moisture, but they're not very permeable, so they do hold the moisture. They don't let it pass through. They're not permeable. So a nice little word there. Sand soils are very permeable and they let the material go through rather quickly, easily. So water materials just rush straight on through where clay soils tend to hold the moisture and they become saturated and then the water doesn't go through very well anymore. So as far as the size of the materials, students have a hard time with this one. Clay is the smallest material. Now, if you want to have a, a nice soil for growing crops or even grass, you want something that's called a loam, which is a mixture of all three particles, kind of a 30-30-30 you know, split of all three of them. And as far as how you name these things, if you want to have a really nice material, you probably want what's called a sandy loam. And the first word modifies the second. So it is a loam, and sandy is how it's described. So sandy describes the loam. It's primarily a loam, and it's sandy. Okay, we got it. So why is water so important? Well, because of all of these little factors that go into it. These all influence why water is such an important material. It's very, it is completely unique, and it really uh, influences why we are um, able to live.
Okay, I'm going to stop here and we'll do one more lecture after this.